Starting the Wanderer, <clears throat> which is a poem in. It's a bad thing about using this. I don't have much white here. Of course, I can just write right here. Um, every now and then you'll see a screen in Peck Hall that does have writing on it. Which is a poem in the Exeter Manuscript. It's called the Exeter Manuscript because it is housed in the Exeter Cathedral, or the Cathedral in Exeter, in Exeter, England. And it's, it's one of a few manuscripts that we, we know the provenance, that is, its history and where it began. Um, it was willed to the cathedral by Leverich, Bishop, L-E-O-F-R-I-C, uh, kind of in the kingdom of love. It's a nice name if you think about it. Um, in the early 11th century, about 10, 13, right around there. Um, it's one of the largest collections of Old English poetry that we have. Okay. Um, what else do I want to say? I should mention this. There are four great manuscript collections, which they're called codices. Singular of that is codex. Okay? There are four great codices of Old English poetry. You have the Exeter Manuscript. You have what's called the Junius Manuscript. This is the one I mentioned the other day that has Cadman's, um, supposedly has Cadman's poetry or in the 19th century, it was thought to be Cadman's poetry. So you have the Junius manuscript. You have um, then you have the Beowulf manuscript, and the other one. Oh, it's just. It's at a church in Italy. It has the Dream of the Rune and another poem. And my mind is just going to stay blank on it. Vercelli. <clears throat> and the Vercelli manuscript. So there are these four great collections of poetry. And then there's a whole bunch of little snippets and, and pieces, but this is, this is the vast majority of Old English verse in those four manuscripts. The two poems that we're doing today and Thursday, the Wanderer and the Seafarer, are both lyric poems. Now, we tend to think of lyric, excuse me, not what I want. That's what happens when we teach on two hours of sleep. Um, not lyric, elegies. E L E G Y. They're both elegies. I mean, they are lyric poems of sorts, in that they express a kind of a personal feeling, but they're elegies. What's an elegy? Isn't it like a person who's going through an old poem? It's a use that you know, right? Mm. Really close. You're thinking eulogy, oh, okay. right? But they're 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 very similar. Eulogy. Yeah, kind of. EU Greek logos. The EU means good or beautiful. Logos word. So when someone dies, you deliver a eulogy. You deliver a beautiful or good word about that person. Okay? You don't deliver a dislogy. You know. Eulogy, beautiful good word. Dislogy would be what? A dissing. It'd be the opposite. <laughs> it's a bad word. Yeah, John died, but that's good because he was a rotten SOP who you, know, you don't do that kind of thing. And I won't go into politics, but I easily could. Okay, so eulogy, beautiful, good word. Notice you've got the legi part in this word, 
L G. Okay, that's the word part. But here it's the E is from, I think, probably from X, which is out of away, or word out of away. Well, what does that mean? It's a loss. An elegy is expressing a lament, a loss of something. So you do often have at funerals eulogies that are elegiac. Why? Because somebody died. And you're expressing the lament over that person's loss, over your loss of that person. You have elegies, you know, not talking about Anglo-Saxon, modern, modern elegies. You can have elegies over all kinds of things. And, and you'll see modern elegiac poems over, you know, someone's, I'm making one up, loss of their phone. But you have them over loss of cars, loss of youth. Okay. Loss of childhood, loss of innocence. I mean, William Blake wrote a, two volumes of poetry. Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience. The Songs of Experience, they're kind of elegies for the Songs of Innocence. That you grow up in what can sometimes happen as you grow older. What, what characterizes children, or should characterize them? Excitement. Excitement, what else? Innocence. Innocence. Naivety. Okay. And then what happens as they get older? They lose that innocence. They might sometimes become even more naive. <laughs> okay. Tolkien, in his essay on fairy stories, says, you know, it's, it's the job of children to grow up. But he says, it's not necessary that we lose innocence when we grow up. Yeah, we often do. Had a, a colleague the other day, I sent him an email about something. And he said, you know, glad to hear from you. Hope your semester is off to a good beginning or how is your semester beginning or something like that. And I said, you know, I replied to the other stuff and I said, you know, as for the beginning of the semester, I'm jaded. Why? Because I've been doing this for so long, it's like there's, you know, I don't want to have the excitement that I used to have at the beginning of the semester. It's just a job, you know, kind of thing. That's an elegiac kind of term. So the wanderer and the seafarer are both elegies. What are they lamenting, however, as we read through them? What is this poet for the wanderer, which is the one we're going to start with? Saying has been lost, okay? They're often read as companion pieces. Not, not that, you know, the seafarer answers the wanderer, but that they're variations on a theme, so to speak. Well, they are if you look at them both solely as being elegies. But we're going to start with the wanderer. Now, the translation that you have, um, and I think he did almost all the Old English translations, translation that you have is by Roy Liuza, Roy M. Liuza, professor at um, UTK. Uh, before that, he was at Toronto. Before that, I think when I first met him, he was at Tulane. Okay, um, Liuza is one of the top Anglo-Saxonists in the world. I mean, this guy knows the language, knows the criticism, knows the literature inside out, right? Um, and he's probably, not probably, I think he's the best translator. I think his translations are the best that we have, okay, for Old English material. But I'm still going to nitpick. And that's why I've got the Old English up. Because we're going to start off with just the first line and probably spend, I don't know, 10 minutes on one word. Okay, why? Remember what Bede said in talking about Cadman's hymn? In his version of it, when he said, you know, he's lost when he's translated. Exactly. He said, exactly.
This is the sentiment, not the actual order of the words he sang in his sleep, for poetry, no matter how well composed, cannot be literally translated from one language into another without losing much of its beauty and dignity. Okay? So, we begin, I'm going to start with Lewis's translation, and I'll walk kind of through it with what's up there. Let me, um, Always the one alone longs for mercy, the maker's mildness, though troubled in mind. Across the ocean ways he has long been forced to stir with his hands the frost-cold sea and walk in exile's path. Weird is fully fixed. Okay? Always the one alone longs for mercy. Always. What could we use here? What, what is this word? Often. Often. Okay. What's the difference between always and often? Often only happens like every once in a while. So you only, you only okay. Or often happens a lot of times. But it's not always. Okay, so notice, very first word. What does the translation do? It makes what they're describing like a continual condition rather than something that happens. Okay. So what else does it do? I mean, you're entirely right, Trevor. Makes it concrete with this. You can still interpret it. Bingo. The translation fix, uh, fixes the interpretation. It doesn't give you any wiggle room, right? Whereas... If you translate it often, it, it allows a little bit more wiggle room, okay? So often the one alone longs for mercy. Often, him, Anhaga, are you beat him? Him, that's either dative or accusative case for the masculine pronoun. He, so often something, Anhaga, that's the solitary, that's the alone, the one alone, the man alone. Are you beat it? Are is what gets translated here as mercy. So there's two words really that I want to spend a few minutes on. Are in Yabidav, okay? Uh, uh, all right, can be mercy. It can also be favor. It can be grace. It can even be, if you extend it, gift or gifts, if you want. These can all be plural also, okay? So, off of the one alone, Something, we're going to leave the verb alone for a minute. Mercy, grace, gift, favor. You beat it. What does Leusa translate this as? What's the verb? Longs. Longs for. Or longs. Yeah, it could be that. But it could also be awaits. It could also, how do you know that? It's, yeah, because he has a footnote. It can also be awaits. It can also be expects. It can also be experiences. Now, these three are somewhat similar. Longs for, awaits, Expects. Okay. But what's the difference between longs for and expects? Connotation. Louder? Connotation. Okay. Desire versus uh, entitlement. Desire versus entitlement. Okay, what else? He wants it to happen when it's longs for, like he wants it to happen, or expects like it should happen. It should happen. That is, with expectation, there's kind of a more 
concrete notion that it will be received at some point. Okay? Longs for may not be, right? Um, the brain is so fresh. Irish author writing in the mid 20th century wrote a play, wrote it in French, premiered in France in 1950 51. Dot, dot, dot. For Godot. It's waiting for Godot. Notice, it's not expecting Godot. Why? What's the difference between those two? If you're expecting something to happen, you have a reasonable belief that that is going to happen, right? For example, we expect the sun to go down tonight and to rise in the morning. Notice my old archaic terminology there. Why do we expect that? Because it always happens. Because it happened last night, <laughs> today, it happened the day before, and it's happened for however many million years, billion years before. Is it a surety, an absolute 100% certainty that will happen? No, it's not. Because what, theoretically, could happen? Yeah. It could be all of our astrophysics wrong. Okay. So, long for Godot. Yeah, they do long for Godot. Waiting, yeah, they are waiting for Godot. Expecting, hmm. Experience? No, they don't ever experience Godot. So notice that that verb, yabita, multiple meanings, because we didn't, haven't even gotten to this one. What's the difference between longing for something and experiencing something? What's the difference between you're a seven-year-old kid and your family has put up the Christmas tree four weeks before Christmas and your parents are really cruel, sadistic, you know, SOEs, and they pile all the presents three weeks before Christmas under the tree? Wait. That's not experiencing those presents. That's longing for, that's waiting for. Notice, there is the expectation, right? That you will get to open those. Right? I mean, long for. Longing for is the tree being put up four weeks before Christmas and nothing ever goes under it. And you go to bed Christmas Eve and there's still nothing there. That's good. Mm -hmm. Not so sure about this whole Santa bit. Yeah, I was so disappointed when Santa wasn't real. Okay. How about, sorry for those of you who heard that. <laughs> How about this? You have a job. You are longing for a raise. Anybody in that position? Yeah, we've been told we're getting one, but I don't ever count on them until the money's in the bank. You are awaiting away a raise. Channel my air over foot. Awaiting a wage. <laughs> you are expecting a raise. Why? Because we've been told we're going to get one. Notice there's a difference between those. But this is the one we want, right? You want to experience that raise. You want to see that jump in pay from $11 an hour to $12 or $15 or whatever dollars an hour. Why? Because that's great. Because that means you have the reality of that. So, always the one alone longs for mercy, favor, grace, etc., waits for mercy, favor, grace, etc., expects. It's hugely different. Mercy, favor, grace, etc., or experiences. See, if you translate that experiences, what does that do for everything that comes after that? It changes the meaning. It changes the meaning entirely of the poem. So by simply saying longs for mercy, the translator has done what? Changed the meaning. Told you the meaning. Told you. This is my interpretation. Why? Because every act of translation is an act of interpretation. <laughs> every time. Because what must you how many of you have taken a foreign language before? What do you have to do when you translate from that foreign language into our English? Okay, what else? You cut out a whole bunch of opportunities, a whole bunch of possibilities. You narrow down one, what does it do to all the others? 
shuts them off from consideration. Okay? So, always the one alone, something for something. Mancunus Miltza, the mercy of God, the favor of God, the grace of God. Leuza translates Miltza, mildness of the Maker. Okay? The mildness of the Maker is rephrasing this. It's set in apposition, it is restating it. Okay? Though troubled in mind, though he, okay, he is troubled in mind. That's what mode care, mode mind carry, full of cares. He's preoccupied, and notice it's not a good preoccupation. It's troubling. Across the ocean ways, yond. That's what yond is like. Yonder. The lagunata of ocean waves, long shoda must has to what? Hrerin mid hondum, hrerin row with what? Hands. Notice he's not rowing like this. He's not rowing with oars. He's rowing like this. Not swimming. He's in a small little boat. Probably an Irish coracle, okay, which is like five, six feet long, two or three feet wide, and you move through the water like this, okay. What? The hrem calda, rhyme, okay, frost rhyme. Frost rhyme. The hrem cold, ice cold sea, wagon. Wade, okay, a walk, in threplestas. We still have both of these words today. Okay. Lastas, you may not be aware of it, but the shape of the bottom of your shoe or sandal is called a last. It's a cobbler's term. It's the footprint. Okay. Rack. Rack. What is a rack? <laughs> <laughs> the gods must be crazy. Rack is the word from which we get rich. So, the footprints of the wretch. Well, who is wretched in Anglo Saxon society? See, not everybody's rich. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you're a wretch. Wretch has a singular meaning. Exile. You are wretched if you are in exile. Why? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be exiled? You have no home. You have been, no home? It means you can't go back to your home. And you can't go back. Why not? You probably committed a crime. To be exiled means you've been kicked out. Okay? It can have another meaning, however. What if your home is no longer there? <laughs> that is, it's been destroyed. You know, Star Wars. They're making their way on the Millennium Falcon to Alderaan. What happens en route? At that point, Princess Leia becomes an exile. She can never go home again, right? Because home is little bits of dust floating off in space. So that's what it means to be wretched. Okay? So, unpack the whole thing now. Often the solitary one or the person alone, I'll throw out my interpretation, experiences the grace or mercy, or experiences grace or mercy, the mildness of God, even the, though he full of cares around the ocean, long must Row with his hands, the ice cold sea, tread the paths of exile. Weird bit full of red. How does Lyusa translate weird? Insane. He doesn't, other than the footnote. Why? 
Why doesn't he translate it? We don't have an equivalent for that word in modern English. It often gets translated fate. Or sometimes even destiny. Doesn't work though. Weird, if you have to translate it into English, one, you can't use a single word. You have to use a phrase. Something like, what will be, will be. That's pretty much weird. Whatever is going to happen is going to happen. You can't change it. You can work with it, okay, but you can't change it. So, so is whatever, it inevitability? Yeah, kind of. Whatever will be, will be, is fully, completely, entirely a rad. Rad, without the prefix, means advised. You get arrested. What must an officer do? Read you your rights. Read you your rights. Is that because the officer is an idiot and can't memorize the little Miranda rule? No. Read there means advise. It's the only instance where the old English meaning of the word read is still used today. Okay? It's not, you have the right to remain silent. It's not reading, it's advising you of your rights. So, weird biff fully advised. In other words, it's kind of like this eternal decree. This eternal counsel, it ain't going to change. That's the point. Nothing will stop this. Okay? So how does this tie in with the rest of this? Especially these two words. How does weird tie in to waiting for, longing for, expecting, or experiencing the grace, mercy, favor, gift of God? Hmm. Does it make them futile? No, I think it's more of a case of you will experience the grace of God. Whether or not you want to? <laughs> okay. So said, quoth, the raven nevermore, so quoth the air gestapa. Air, earth, So said the wanderer, in other words, the person who walks the earth. Rather, rather, excuse me, well, we're not going to go through every line like this because we, we finished the semester. Well, it's like the mindful of troubles, when am I a career? Cruel slaughters and the dear kinsman's downfall. Okay. This is dear kinsman. This is their downfall. And here's what he then says. Often alone, often alone in the first light of dawn, I have sung my lament. Wait, why is it here often and not always? Because the first time we saw oft, it was translated always. Now it's the exact same word, and now it gets translated often. Because you're not always singing songs of woman. First thing in dawn. But apparently this guy, because he's been alone for a long time, he often does. Okay, So often alone, first light of dawn, I've sung my lament. This is what he says. Okay. There is none living to whom I would dare to reveal clearly my heart's thoughts. Why not? We don't know yet. All we know is that he's saying there's none, nobody alive to whom I would reveal what's really going on in here. Okay? I know it is true that it is a nobleman's lordly nature to closely bind his spirit's coffer, hold fast his treasure hoard, whatever he may think. Now, the speaker is telling us there what noble behavior does. A nobleman takes all the problems he has and does what? Wraps them all up and buries them deep inside. 
doesn't go on Oprah and have, you know, the public confessional or Dr. Phil, it'd be even better. You know. Does what? You know, what is a, a kind of a maxim or a characterization sometimes given, you have to be pretty culturally aware, so you might not be aware of this, of the British. They have a stiff upper lip. That is, whatever happens, don't cry, don't smile. The stiff upper lip means expressionless. You grin and bear it. You take whatever happens and just go on. Okay? Whatever he may think. What's the whatever he may think, though? What does that imply? The nobleman might think the world is going to hell in a handbasket. That it's all going downhill. It's all erupting. But he doesn't do what? Here I'll get political. He doesn't get on Twitter. <laughs> okay? And that goes for both parties, by the way. The weary mind cannot withstand weird. The weary mind. The mind that is, what word did we see? Full of cares. But full of cares is not just weary. Weary implies what else? It's both been full of cares what? For a long time. See, you don't, you don't have a weary mind if you've only had problems for a week. If you have a weary mind if you've had problems for a week, after week, after week, after month, You have a weary mind if you were like Hrothgar in the poem Beowulf that we'll spend too much time on, who wakes up one morning to find out his men have all been slaughtered and eaten, his men that stayed in the night in Herod. And then he wakes up the next night, and the men who stay in Herod that night end up eaten. And he does this every night for 12 stinking years. The morning of the 12th year anniversary, he has a weary mind. Why? Because it never changes. Right? That's what this poet is getting at. The troubled heart can offer no help. And so those eager for fame often bind fast in their breast coffers a sorrowing soul. Why? Okay. The weary mind and the troubled heart might be speaking about the wanderers who is speaking. They might also be speaking about somebody else's. And the reason you don't open your heart to another person is, guess what? It's not going to do you any good. They can't do what? Remove the weariness? Take the cares away? So, if you are eager for fame, he doesn't mean modern Hollywood news media fame. He means a lasting positive reputation. Like, after you die. Like what happened with Beowulf, right? Bingo, like what happened with Beowulf. They do what? If you want this kind of fame, you bind fast in your breast coffer. Well, what's your breast coffer? Okay. In your heart. Okay. You do what? You bind all that up there. Just as I have had to take my own heart, often wretched, cut off from my own mind, far from dear kinsmen, and do what? Bind it in fetters. Wrap it with chain. Is what he means. Why? Ever since long ago, I hid my gold-giving friend. It's line 22. My gold-giving friend. gold Wina mina Right there. gold Wina mina Why is that jumping around so much? Okay. gold Wina. Gold friend mine. 
He hasn't really translated that. All he's done is he's thrown in a giving. Well, who is my gold-giving friend? It's not my bank officer. It's his Lord. So why did Elijah just translate that, my Lord? Because the Lord is the one who distributes gold. See, this is a Germanic mentality. Which I'm going to um, talk a little bit about more when we get to Baal. But it, it applies to this too. In, a, in the Germanic system, you have a Lord. In the center of society, the center of your culture, your tribe, if you want, we probably won't finish the water today, is the hall. Okay? The hall is where the Lord reigns. It's where the Lord gives out treasure. It's where the Lord dispenses justice. All right? The Lord sit, sits in the place of preeminence, and the Lord has, working for him, serving him, his... Things. Okay? Think of them as knights, though knight would be an anachronistic term. Knights come later. The things are his warriors. And here's how the Lord thing relationship works. The Lord sends the things off into battle. Let's assume the things win. The things take all the spoils of battle, they come back, they give it to their Lord. The Lord then takes those spoils from battle and apportions it out to the things. Notice there is a reciprocity here. They fight for him, he gives them gold and treasure. That's why he is the gold friend. He distributes gold. All right? So there's a, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Kind of a relationship. So he says, ever since I did what? I hid my gold-giving friend in the darkness of earth. He buried him. All right? And went wretched. Why is he wretched? He's not going to be away. Because he's exiled. Because the implication is the hall is no longer there. <laughs> See, there's really only one reason to bury your Lord. The hall has been destroyed. Yeah, the hall has been destroyed and the Lord is dead. And you're alive for some reason. It's a wrinkle in the, in the narrative. See, in Germanic fashion, I was going to do this later, but I'll do it now. Germanic fashion, you have what's called, and it's called by a writer named C.L. Wren, in a book called A Study of Old English. Notice what I'm doing here, by the way. Give me credit to the person who came up with the idea. Study of Old English. You have the four field, fourfold Germanic ethic. Ethic. Way of behaving among other people. Okay? First, duty to your Lord. Second, duty to your kin. Pretty important. Three, duty to avenge your Lord and or kin. And for, for lack of a better way of putting it, a reliance on weird. Not that weird will work for, it's just blindly trusting that what will be will be. So, you, sh you have a duty, a responsibility to your Lord, you have a duty or responsibility to your kin, if something happens to your Lord and or your kin, you have a duty to avenge your Lord and kin. See, part of this is, if your Lord leads you into battle, guess what? If he dies, you should die with him. With one proviso. Unless you're the last man standing. Or the last man standing. But your Lord gets separated from you. But that doesn't happen much in Germanic literature. Usually what happens is the men go down circling their Lord. We have a great example from an old English poem called the Battle of Malden, an actual historical battle, English against Vikings. And the English leader, not the king, local tribal chieftain, okay, gets hacked down. And his men, rather than go, well, okay, Beardnoss dead, we'll see you later, Vikings, we're going back home now. 
They make a wall around his bloody, hacked up, butchered body, and they die defending his corpse. They're all wiped out. That's the idea. That's the heroic ideal. But for some reason, this guy's alive. We don't know why. Some have suggested he was a coward. He doesn't sound like a coward, though, as we'll get through the rest of the poem. Maybe the enemy showed him mercy. Could be the enemy showed him mercy, in which case eh, it would imply some cowardice on his part. He should have challenged them so that he ends up dead. The more likely thing is, for what, whatever reason, he wasn't there at the time of the battle. It might have been he was off guarding somewhere else. He was in another part of the tribal area. And it was a swift raid. Everybody killed. He sees smoke. He rides to where the smoke is. And all he finds is the hall. And he finds his Lord's body and buries him. So what does he do? Because his Lord is dead, I went wretched. Winter said over the ice-locked wave, sought. Hall sick. Why? He's sick for a hall because he doesn't have one. This is why, this is why I, I suggest, you know, the hall has been totally destroyed. Okay. He's seeking what? A new lord. A treasure giver. Wherever I might find, far or near, someone in a mead hall, meduseld, if you're Tolkien, familiar with Tolkien, Meduseld is um, King Theoden's hall in the land of Rowan. It's from him. It's here. It's literally Medu, Mead, Seld, Hall. Okay? Where I might have find a meat hall, someone in a meat hall who might know my people. He's trying to find a lord who knew his lord. Or who would want to comfort me friendless. Accustom me to joy. That is, who would want to erase my weary mind. That's why he is treading the paths of exile. He's looking for a new hall and a new lord to serve. He who has come to know a cruel companion is sorrow for one with dear friends will understand. This is a gnomic passage. Gnomic. G-N-O-M-I-C. It is not a passion spoken by gnomes. You know, little garden things. Gnomic here means what? Anybody know? Proverb or wisdom. We already saw one earlier. I just didn't point it out. The beginning one? No, not the... Well, you can maybe take that as. But when he talks about it being a lordly... A nobleman's lordly nature to lock up that breastwork. Okay? That's a gnomic passage. Okay? By saying this is a wisdom passage, this is something the, the speaker wants us to understand. This is commonly understood by those within this society. So, he who has come to know how cruel a companion is sorrow for one with your friends will understand. If you've been in my shoes, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. This is kind of like the 8th century AD version of identity politics. If you've been a name your identity group, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay? Here's what he will understand. The path of exile claims him. Notice, it's not that he chooses it. He has to do this, he's saying. Not pattern gold. A winter-bound spirit, not the wealth of earth. You have to go out in search rather than live with wealth. Why, though? He doesn't answer the why. Not at this point. He remembers. He who? He who has come to know how cruel a companion is sorrow for one with few dear friends. What, what is that for one with few dear friends? 
How few dear friends does this wanderer have? Opening line. The one all alone. Okay. The few dear friends. That's an example of litotes. L-I-T-O-T-E-S. It's understatement. It is extreme understatement. We're going to see in a poem in a few days. You know. Dream of the rude. Jesus is killed on the cross and he gets buried. And we're told few of his friends stayed there with him in the tomb. How few of his friends? None. Because <laughs> he was buried. Okay. So the person who understands all this, he will remember hall holders. That is the people who sit in the hall and treasure taking Taking how? Because the Lord is distributing it. How in his youth his gold-giving Lord accustomed him to the feast. In his youth. What is that implying about the wanderer? I'm old now. Been around a bit. That joy has all ended. He's not looking. The implication is for that kind of joy anymore. So maybe he's looking for a different kind of Lord. And so he who has long been forced to forego his loves, his Lord's beloved words of counsel will understand. When sorrow and sleep both together often bind up the wretched exile. That is, when you go to sleep full of sorrow and you wake up full of sorrow. In other words, sorrow is what binds your existence together. It seems in his mind that he clasps and kisses his Lord of men, and on his knee he lays hands and head. Why it seems in his mind? He can't speak because he has to keep it. Okay, he can't let it out, but he's all alone. So how else does it seem in his mind? Notice, you go to sleep thinking of something. What often happens when you're sleeping? You dream. You dream. But that thing that you were thinking of when you went to sleep and that you then had in your mind when you sleep, you wake up and you still have it. And this goes on for day after day after day after day after day after day after day. And you're out on the cold water with little food and water. What might start happening to you? You might hallucinate. You might hallucinate. Right? And what does he see? He sees his Lord of men, and he clasps and kisses his Lord of men, and on his knee lays hands and head. Why? Shut up, Siri. Why would he lay his hands and head on his Lord's knee? This clasping of the knee, this is an ancient idea. We see it in the biblical Old Testament. We see it in other cultures. It is a means of begging for mercy. We also see it in the Lord of the Rings. Okay? Why? Because Tolkien was very in tune with all that kind of mentality. In the Aeneid, there's a scene when this one character goes up to another. He's been defeated in battle, and he puts his arms around the guy who defeated him, his knees, lays his head on his knee, and begs for mercy. And the other guy, you know, there is no mercy in the Aeneid. As he sometimes long ago in earlier days enjoyed the gift throne. Yeast stone. The gift stool. What is that? That's the seat where the king sits and from which he distributes treasure or out of which he distributes treasure. The speaker is telling us he wasn't just a mere hanger-on in his Lord's hall. He sat close to his Lord. Okay? But when the friendless man, ah, awakens again. So this has been happening when? In his sleep. And sees before him the foul waves, seabirds bathing, spreading their feathers, frost falling in snow, mingled with hail. Then the heart's wounds are that much heavier, longing for his loved one. Sorrow is renewed. 
when the memory of kinsmen flies through the mind. So, earlier, when he had the image of his Lord, sees himself clasping and kissing his Lord's knees, he was dreaming. But now he's awake. He sees the birds out on the ocean. And the memory of kinsmen flies through his mind. He's awake now. And he's thinking of what he was dreaming about. But it's not actually thinking about the dreaming. He's thinking back to what life was like. And what does he do? This is where he hallucinates. He sees the birds and greets them with great joy. Greedily surveys hall companions. And they swim away. Yeah, but his hall companions didn't used to swim away. Why? Because they're not mere people. <laughs> they're not ocean people. No. The floating spirits bring too few familiar voices. Too few. How few is that? Gusek. Because what kind of voices do these floating spirits bring? <laughs> the calls of birds. These aren't voices he recognizes. Cares are renewed for one who must sin over and over a weary heart across the binding waves. Notice your footnote. The grammar and reference of this intense, almost hallucinatory scene is not entirely clear. The translation reflects one commonly proposed reading. Notice, the translation reflects one proposed reading. That is, it directs you to. It takes away all other opportunities or all other possibilities. And so I cannot imagine for all this world why my spirit should not grow dark when I think through all this life of man. Who's, is this, and so spoke the wanderer? Or is this a different voice speaking? In other words, the wanderer has this experience. And maybe now another voice goes, yeah, you know, and I think about that experience and I think, you know, life sucks. And that's the common thread of all humanity. Life sucks. Why should my spirit not grow dark when I think through all this life of men? How suddenly they gave up the hall floor. Hall floor? The word that's used there? Flet. Again, if you know Tolkien, when Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, Frodo, Sam, Mary, Pippin arrive at the land of Galadriel, and they meet Galadriel for the first time. They go up into her tree, she lives in a tree, and arrive on the flat, is what Tolkien calls essentially the tree house. Okay? So he's taking Old English and using it. But what does he mean how they suddenly gave up the hall floor? It's a euphemism. It is a eulogy, a beautiful word for death. Not how they suddenly croaked, suddenly died. It's they passed away. They reposed in the Lord. They kicked the bucket, you know. Mighty young retainers. Notice, it's the young retainers who suddenly died. It's like this was a sudden onslaught. Thus this middle earth droops and decays every single day. What does that imply about tomorrow? It'll be worse, It'll be worse than today. And the day after that will be worse than tomorrow. And the day after that will be worse than that day. What kind of outlook on life is this? Yeah, kind of Ragnarokish, you know. It's not, hey, today's a beautiful, wonderful day, you know. Smile, this is the day the Lord hath made. Uh-uh. This is, this, you know, smile for today we die. What did they, I don't remember which Greek play it was, or, or which um, Greek writer, but one of them said, you know, smile for today we die. Eat, drink, and be merry, for today we die. Thus this middle earth dupes and decays every single day. And so, Gnomic passage, a man cannot become wise before he has weathered his share of winters in this world. In other words, to be wise what? What must you do? Survive. 
survive, endure. You don't become wise by taking an easy exit. Suicide. What Wisdom equals what? Endurance. Suffering. A wise man, excuse me, before he has shethered, shethered his wear, or weathered his share, of winters in this world. And for some reason, no idea why, Anglo-Saxons, at least in the po poetry and literature, they kind of dated things by the number of winters you lived. Think about that for a moment. Why not the number of springs? Because winter is when most people die. Yeah, because summer and spring, those are easy. Winter, that's when you're running out of food. That's when you have cold weather. And, you know, not, ten well, it is cold, Tennessee, but Britain. And we're not talking, you know, central heat and air and such. So, a wise man must be patient. What does that word patient mean? I don't remember what the old English is used there. 66. We to show you still do. Yeah, okay. A wise man must be patient. What does patient mean? Willingness to wait. Willingness to wait. Okay. Does it imply more than that? Uh, has a calm connotation. Does it always have a calm connotation? It is patience is a virtue. What other word is related to patient? Still. Still? What about the word endure? So, endure, calm, wait. What else? What other meaning does this word have? Totally different noun. Or as a noun, not an adjective. When you're sick, when you are a hospital patient, what does that imply? Sickness. Okay. Sickness. What else? Suffering. Suffering. Okay. Notice a wise man's got to do all of this, but this too. Go back to our seven-year-old waiting for Christmas. You put all those presents out, and you tell the little kid, be patient. What are you saying? Wait, yeah, okay. Be, endure, yeah, okay. Be calm, that's a little harder. What you're essentially doing is you're saying suffer a little while. We'll put a bunch of food out in front of somebody who's hungry and say, ah, wait. Wait for parents. Be patient. <laughs> yeah, but I haven't eaten in a week. Wait. You're saying suffer there. Okay? So the wise man must be patient. He has to suffer, because suffer implies endure. It also implies what? You will come through this. There will be light at the end of that tunnel. It's just when you enter the tunnel, you can't see the light yet. <laughs> but you have to do what? Go through the tunnel. Neither too hot-hearted nor too hasty with words. Hot-hearted. What does it imply? I don't know what cold-hearted means. Okay, you know what cold-hearted means. Hot-hearted is the opposite. What else? Does hot-hearted simply mean angry? Not really. Vengeful. Louder? Vengeful. Vengeful, possibly. I don't want to get all political. But... What is probably one of the predominant characteristics of the current president? He doesn't take crap from anyone. Okay, not the one. Think of Twitter. He's impulsive. Impulsive. That's hot hearted. Passionate. Passion. You know, passionate can have good meanings and bad meanings. 
But passionate means being ruled by the passions. Not stopping to think, just boom, reacting. That's what's meant here by hot heart. Simply reacting, okay? Nor too hasty with words. Somebody says something, boom, you blast them with both barrels. Wait. Wait a minute, okay? This is the wise man. So notice the wise man must be patient, must endure. That means what? If you are hot-hearted, cool it. If you are too hasty with words, stop it. Neither nor too weak in war, nor too unwise in thoughts. Okay, now maybe we can, since I want to be equal opportunity, you know, political bashing, let's go back to the previous president. Too weak in war. Here's a red line. Don't go. I don't, okay, not that one. Here's a red. Here's what happens when you make too many red lines. What happens when you tell a child, Johnny, don't do that or I'm going to spank. No, I'm serious this time. And 20 times later, what's Johnny think? You know, middle finger to you because I know you're not going to do anything. Okay, That's what's implied by too weak in war. Right? Nor too, too unwise in thoughts. Hmm. What does he mean by too unwise in thoughts? Think things through. Think things through? Look at the next line. I think the next line is telling us what too unwise in thoughts mean. Neither fretting, nor fawning, nor greedy for wealth. Fretting. I don't have enough money. Fawning, I want more and more money. Or fawning over somebody, speaking all kinds of kind, loving, wonderful words about them, nor too greedy for wealth, never eager for boasting before he truly understands. Truly understands what? That he can back what he says. Bingo. In other words, don't enter a situation and say, yeah, well, here's what I'm going to do. What does every presidential candidate running in a primary, let's say, for the respective parties, what does every presidential candidate do? Tell us what they're going to do. They make promises, and then? He tries to keep them. Do they? No. Really? Not usually. I would say this is one of the things that makes Trump different. He's actually done, whatever you think of them. And a lot of people like them, a lot of people don't like them. Cutting regulations. Regulation lovers don't like regulations being cut. Regulation haters say, cut them all, you know. But don't say what you can't do. A man must wait when he makes a boast. Wait for what? Until the brave spirit because every hero in here, I can do it. I can solve all the problems of the world. Every presidential candidate in here thinks what? I can do it. Why? What characteristic marks every presidential candidate? Though they will say to your face, no, that's not true. Every one of them is a huge egomaniac. You have to be. The nature of the job demands it. I mean, what are you saying when you run for president? I, and I alone, am the one person out of 330 million who can solve all the problems of our country. If I can just get all of you to follow me. Just listen to what I say. Get the 435 members of Congress, excuse me, 535 members of Congress to agree with me and get the whole behemoth of bureaucracy behind me. We will all march off into Nirvana. I mean, you've got to have in order to believe that. Until the brave spirit understands truly where the thoughts of his heart will turn. Okay? In other words, when push comes to shove, you make all these promises, and then what happens? You meet the boogeyman. And you go, oh, 
I never realized the problem was this bad. You know, they've been telling us lies all along. There isn't really all this money left in Social Security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? The wise man must realize how ghastly it will be when all the wealth of this world stands waste. I can never remember. Hold on. Yeah, let me go So the wise man must realize how it will be when all the wealth of this world stands. What's he talking about? Ragnarok? Judgment Day? You know, Terminator version? Atomic warfare? Just Yeah, possibly. He could be talking about the end of the world. As now, here and there throughout this middle world, or middle earth, walls stand blasted by wind, beaten by frost, the buildings crumbling. What's he talking about? Hard winters. Hard winters? Is that all? Walls crumbling. A test of endurance? Close. When the Germanic tribes, the Anglo Saxon and the Jews, came to England, mid-5th century, and conquered the Brits that lived there. What else did they find? Vikings. No, nope, Vikings come later. Scots, Irish. Yeah, they were up north. I mean, what physical remains of previous cultures? Who else, who was there before the Anglo-Saxons and Jews, other than the Brits? The Romans. What did the Romans build out of? What were they known for building? I mean, you go to Rome today, and you can see the Colosseum. You can see the Forum, made out of stone. Anglo-Saxon Jutes built out of timber. The British, the Celts, built out of timber. When the Romans came in and conquered, they brought in Roman building technology. You can still walk around various places in London today, and there are some you can walk up to and go, oh, this is totally cool. That's a Roman wall. You touch it. Still happens. And, you know, you can go to Stonehenge and pretend to be blind. Go in, put on dark glasses, and get a cane. I'm only partly kidding. I had a blind student once who did a study abroad thing, and because he was blind, they took him up to the stones. So he got to go up there and you know, touch the stone. And I, ever since then, I thought, I really ought to, you know, be horrible. <laughs> but I really want to touch those stones. First time I went to London, went to the British Museum, and they, they had the Rosetta Stone, which they still do, but it wasn't under a box then. It was just standing there. Okay, if you know how important the Rosetta Stone is for understanding hieroglyphics and stuff, it's pretty important. And it had the little sign, do not touch. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody went up and at least touched that thing, you know. How big was the stone? Well, it's about three feet. Oh, it's about three feet tall. And, I don't know, maybe twenty-four inches in width. But you know, you could go up there and go, uh, pretend you're reading Braille, and and everything else, you know, at that point was all uncovered. So people are going up and touching, you know, mummies and all this kind. Of, most of it's now under glass because of idiots like me. Right? So, as now here and there throughout this Middle Earth wall stand blasted, what walls? Roman ruins is probably what he's talking about. Because the timber walls would be gone. The wine halls topple. Their rulers lie deprived of all joys. Why? Because they're dead, rotting corpses. The proud old troops all fell by the wall. That is, they died defending what is now crumbling masonry. War carried off some, sent them on the way. One, a bird carried, we're not talking about giant eagles, you know, coming and picking people up off and carrying them. A bird carried not one entire, but you know, think of a body on the ground. What parts do vultures and other birds of prey, including eagles, go for? The soft stuff, 
eyes first. So pecked off a piece of, piece of flesh and flew away. One, the gray wolf shared with death. And one, a sad-faced man covered in an earthen grave. Well, what did he say earlier? I... What? Hid in the ground my gold giving friend. He's talking about himself. It's like everybody else died but me. And so I buried my Lord. The creator of men thus destroyed this walled city until the old work of giants, old English. Inta, you aware? Inta, that's where Tolkien gets his it from, okay? The old work of giants stood, the old English word there is the word for idol. What's the difference between idol and empty? Idol stands, empty is a container that is... Okay. What else? Idol is still there. Empty would not be. Possibly. Well, I mean, Samantha? Idol implies like waiting for something, and empty is just like finality, like that's it. Idol, it's not being used. A car that is, that is idling is just sitting there. Notice, it could go. It could do something, but it's not. Now... This old work of giants, this city, he might be talking about. Some have suggested this, that the poet is talking about the old, the city of Bath that you go to today, and there's a city built around the Roman ruins, the pump house, the baths, all that kind of stuff. Okay? But he's talking about that. It stands idle. Nobody lives in this place, but they could without the sounds of the former citizens. You drive out west. Get on Interstate 40. I used to drive back and forth from San Jose, California, Bay Area, Silicon Valley, to Chattanooga, Tennessee, when I was going to school outside Chattanooga. Get on Interstate 40. Drive through Arizona, parts of, Tech, uh, parts of um, New Mexico. You drive through Texas, too. Or even get off Interstate 40 and go north and go through, you know, Parts of Nevada and Utah and Wyoming, and you can drive through what are called ghost towns. But you know what? You can live in those ghost towns. The buildings are still there, but they stand idle. Go to um, Chernobyl in Ukraine. The whole town is still there. It's just nobody lives there. Why? Because there's a little nuclear accident in about 1985 that makes it deadly to live there. Okay? Notice, who does this? The speaker says, God did this. God did this. Okay? The creator of men destroyed this walled city. He who deeply considers with wise thoughts this foundation, this foundation means Earth, the world we land on, we live on. No, he's not saying this deep thought. And this dark life, old in spirit, often remembers so many ancient slaughters and says these words. I know we've only got a few more minutes. This is what's called the ubi sunt motif. Ubi sunt, Latin for where are? In the 1960s, during the height of the Vietnam War, who was it? Peter, Paul, and Mary, I think, had a famous song, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? Okay, Which is talking about the lost youth, the men who died in Vietnam. And so you get this passage. Where are Paul and Mary? Where are Paul and Mago? Where are Paul and Mago? Where are Paul and Simla, you said to where send them celebrate us? Eala Bir Luna, Eala Birnwida, Eala Thermos Grim, who sail fragile at the Napoleon Nicham, 
Swahil Noera. Translated, where has the horse gone? Like mayor, M-A-R-E, where is the mayor? Where is the man or warrior? Where are the treasure uh, treasure givers? Where is the Simla Yesietu? The seats of the feast. Where are the joys of the hall? Oh, the bright cup, oh, the bright warrior, oh, the glory of princes. How that time has passed away, departed under the shadow of night, as if she never was. That is, it's as if nobody had ever lived in this place. Why? What does this speaker, this Anglo-Saxon poet, know of the people who lived in the ruin that he's talking about? Nothing. There is no reputation. There is no fame. It's like the like little green men came from outer space, whoop, sucked them all up and took them away, and nothing remains. Or did they all go? No idea. There still stands in the path of the dear warriors a wall wondrously high with serpentine stains. A storm of spears took away the warriors, meaning battle, bloodthirsty weapons. Weird the mighty. Notice, so spears, weapons, weird, destroyed the warriors. And storms batter these stone walls. Frost falling binds up the earth. A howl of winter when blackness comes. Night's shadow looms, sends down from the north harsh hailstones in hatred of men. The years come, the years go, and they keep doing what? Gradually wearing down these walls. All is toilsome in the earthly kingdom. Al is Ervithlicha, Erthon Richa, kingdom of earth. On windeth, that changes. The working of weird changes the world under heaven. Weird shapes, changes for the world under the heaven. What will be, will be. Notice, cannot be stopped. And then we get these lines. Here befell Lana. Here wealth is fleeting. Fell. It's the word from which we get fee. You pay a fee, you pay a wealth of sorts. Here, fee is Lana. Lana, the word from which we get two things, lean and the verb loan. Here, wealth is lean. It's not, it's not fat, rich, juicy wealth. It's skinny, minuscule wealth. But it's also loan. Those of you who have student loans, you sign a promissory note. What does that promissory note mean? I will pay on time. I promise to, at such and such a date, pay that back. Plus interest. A lot of interest. Plus interest. Here is friend. Lean. Loan. Or as the user translates, what? Transitory or fleeting? Fleeting. Fleeting. Here for a while and gone later. He's not talking about fair weather friends. He's talking about your friends do what? They if die. you live too long, they die. This is why it would be horrible to be a human and immortal, if not everybody was. Because you would have children, and they would die. And their children would die, and their children would die, and you'd be like a damn bunny. Just keep on ticking. Okay? Stop. Here in Mon Lana, here is man, Lana, fleeting. Here is kinsman, fleeting. All this worth, earth, excuse me, all this earth shall stand or become. What's it look like? Idol. Idol. 
And if it will stand idle when here all the people are gone, it will stand what? Empty. Empty. Not used is the implication. It's made. The implication is for something. What? Us. But what happens when we're all dead and gone? Then it's useless. So said the wise one in his mind. Sitting apart in meditation. Why? Because he doesn't verbalize these words. Because it doesn't do any good. He is good who keeps his word. And the man who never too quickly shows the anger in his breast. Unless he already knows the remedy. <laughs> unless he knows what he's going to do. A noble man can bravely bring about. And what does the speaker end with? It will be well for one who seeks mercy. Well, bitham fehim ares seeketh. Well, to him who him are mercy seeks. Frovra, consolation is what that means. From the Father in heaven, where to or for us all the Fastnunga. Replace the U with an I. And what does that look kind of like? Fasting. Fastening. Fastening. Like tying down. Permanence. Stability. Stands. What's the whole poem been about up until this point? It's been about Lana, 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 Lana. What happened to the speaker's lord? Dead. What happened to the speaker's hall? Dead. What happened to the dreams? Dead. What happened to the people? Dead. Here, in this foundation, what characterizes human existence? Change. There's never any permanence. Heraclitus said, all is change. Some of us don't like change. Others love change. Okay? But if you want permanence, if you want real permanence, if you don't want your friends dying on you, your lovers leaving you, etc., he's suggesting what? Seek it where? In heaven. Seek it in heaven. Why? Because that's where real permanence is. That doesn't change. That is permanent forever. Okay? Stop there. The seafarer is going to be on a similar theme, but the conclusion of the seafarer is going to be... It's going to play a difference about that kind of stability, about what you will find there forever.